So the next step in the process is collaboration. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And you heard me talk about 21st century cures and some of the work that's being done in Washington, D.C., but some of the leadership work around collaboration in our industry for the whole world is happening in our state. Please welcome Martha Brumfield from the Critical Path Institute that's going to tell you a little bit more. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Joan, for the invitation to be here. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here and speak with you about what we at Critical Path Institute in Tucson are doing to advance innovation through our model of public-private partnerships. I'm not sure you all really know who we are and what we do, so I'd like to start with a bit of background. And the genesis of our organization is linked very closely to some forward thinking that came out of our FDA, yes, the same FDA the panelists were speaking about, exactly 10 years ago. Dr. Janet Woodcock and others at FDA wrote an incredibly thoughtful document, Innovation and Stagnation, where they identified the problem of the huge gap between basic science and technology as it develops and pulling that science and technology through to drug development and regulatory decision making. And they proposed that the best way to make advances in this space was through partnerships that were truly collaborative and brought together scientists across a broad swath of expertise. Our founder, Dr. Ray Woosley, decided that he wanted to take up the the torch for this and that he wanted to provide the platform to enable some of these conversations and the advancing of science. So CPATH opens its doors in, in 2005 and next year we'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary. The model that we use is illustrated on this slide. And we initially define what is the research objective we're trying to focus on. It could be disease specific, it could be modality specific. And then we go out and seek experts from all over the world, from all walks of life. Every one of the pro project teams we build, which we call a consortium, have at minimum scientists from the biopharmaceutical industry around the globe, scientists from the FDA and from the European Medicines Agency, and sometimes on certain projects from the Japanese agency, the PMDA. Additionally, we bring patient voice into these discussions. We will work with academic institutions, the NIH, the CDC, the World Health Organization. So it, these become very broad coalitions of individuals that have a passion about what we're trying to solve for. And then we lead them to reach consensus on the science and put in place a research plan to develop the data package that will give the regulators the confidence in accepting that new science and technology into their decision making. And the benefit for everyone that participates is that it decreases the risks and the cost for them as an individual or a specific entity. One thing that I believe has been critically important in our success is that we do get some type of a regulatory endorsement at the end of the day. And why is that important? It's important because if the, those who are doing the drug development don't have the confidence that the regulators will accept this very innovative methodology, they're not going to put their program at risk. So we have to make sure that throughout the entire process, we're getting advice from the regulators. After we were in business for several years, both the FDA and the EMA actually identified a formal regulatory process to give an endorsement for these types of emerging technologies, and it's called qualification. So each of them ha now has a formal process and a guidance document that's on their website. And we actually piloted the very first one of these in 2007 with all three agencies concurrently. So we actually have played a role in helping them think through what this process should be. 
Today, we have seven global consortia that, that are ongoing. I'm not going to take the time to walk you through each one of these. I am going to focus um, most of my time on the first one that's on the screen, the Coalition Against Major Diseases, which focuses on very complex neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So many of our consortia, as I said, are very disease focused and others are focusing on modalities that can be used across the, the entire swath of, of drug development, like the PSTC, Predictive Safety Testing Consortium, which is at the bottom of the slide. They develop safety-based biomarkers that can predict organ toxicity, and they're agnostic to the type of drug that you may be developing. And we're actually now taking these into the clinic, and we're doing a collaboration both with the foundation for the NIH, who is running a clinical trial on our behalf, and also with the Innovative Medicines Initiative in Europe, because they are looking at a slightly different set of biomarkers. So we are starting not only to collaborate within our own teams, but to collaborate across other organizations across the country and the globe that are involved in this space. Because all of our resources are too precious. We don't want to waste any time. We don't want to be duplic duplicative. We want to actually help each other be successful because at the end of the day, um, rising tide floats all boats. This slide just demonstrates who our collaborators and some of our consortia members are. So you can see it's, it's fairly global and all the big players and a lot of small players are there as well. And we welcome new members at any time if they have an interest in, in the programs that we're, we're overseeing. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about what we're doing to try and find ways to expedite treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And there are three problem areas that this team identified that they really felt they needed to focus on and we're doing work against all three of them. We are, I'm, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the first one on the list, the clinical trial simulation tool. I'm going to walk you through how we achieved that success. But we also are working on use of biomarkers that can be used to enrich a clinical trial population. And we have just recently started a new program to develop a clinical outcome assessment instrument that can be used in a phase that's called pre-dementia. We believe that the evolving science is showing the only way we'll ever effectively treat Alzheimer's is to start very early in the process, even before there are symptoms. But how do you measure that? So that's the latest program that we're, on, that we're tackling. So this is just a picture from our website, and you see in the red circle the AD trial simulation. This tool is available to anyone that's interested in, in using it, as are all of the deliverables that we create in our consortia. So in 2008, Dr. Ray Woosley met with heads of R&D at a number of big pharma companies and proposed that we try to do something to tackle Alzheimer's disease. And their concern was, even though there are products on the market to treat Alzheimer's disease symptomatically, we know that they're not very effective and that the response period is very short. So they wanted to better understand the progression of this disease. And there was agreement the only way to do that was actually to pool clinical trial data, real world clinical trial data, so that we could aggregate that and query it to understand trends that we were seeing in disease progression. So it took some time to get these incredibly competitive companies to agree to share data with each other, but we were successful in that. And we had across nine companies, 24 clinical trials worth of control arm data. They were not willing to share their drug data, but we could look at control arm. And to date, we have over 6,500 patients worth of data in that trial. As soon as the database was created, we actually made it available for other researchers to, to tap into if they wanted to access that for their own research. So the start point, interesting story, the start point, the data starts coming in and we look at it and it's, it's kind of like fruit salad. You, we couldn't do anything with it because even though every one of these sponsors had used the same clinical trial endpoint, which is the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale for cognition or ADAS cog they all used it differently. They ordered their questions differently. They had the rating scale that was different. So we actually had to pause for a year and go and develop 
a clinical data standard and remap all of this data to that standard so that we actually could fully aggregate the data to make it useful for our purposes. But we achieved that, and as a result, we were able to create this aggregated database, which eventually led to the simulation tool that I'm going to describe for you. So the value proposition got to be able to pool the data. Doing meta-analyses across multiple trials cannot accomplish quite the same thing that we were trying to achieve, and, and that's not adequate, typically, for a regulatory decision. They want to look at individual raw patient-level data. FDA has also presented in several meetings that they can spend up to 40 percent of their review time getting the data that they receive ready for analysis because it's not standardized. So not only in creating the standard have we enabled our work to progress, but we now are partnering with companies who are using these standards in their ongoing trials. So when their NDA gets submitted to the FDA, the FDA is not going to lose 40 percent of their time trying to re-aggregate the data. This is a pictorial of the different data sets we use to develop the disease progression model. So starting at the bottom is our database. So again, this is placebo data. So it gives you a picture of what the placebo effect is in trials, and we all know that their placebo effects are real. Going on to the left, because the companies were not willing to share their drug data, the treatment data, we had to rely on published literature to understand drug effect. And then at the top of the circle is the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging study, which is a longitudinal study that the NIH has been conducting for some time, which really gives you the, the, the historical projection of disease. So putting all this together, having a lot of statisticians and data analytics experts come together, we came up with a mathematical algorithm that can actually show, let me go into this slide, it's a little bit easier to see, that can actually help companies decide how to design their trials. So from our disease progression model, we're, we are now fairly certain of what the underlying disease trajectory look, looks like. It's the first the dotted line that goes um, at the top. We know there is a placebo response that's very short-lived. We also know there's a short drug response for symptomatic treatment, which is the blue line at the bottom, but you can see after a very short period of time, the slope goes right back to what the normal disease progression will be. And the goal is to find something that is actually disease modifying, and there are some studies that are going on to try and determine that. So what, um, what companies can do with this tool, or, or any drug developer or researcher, you take the algorithm, you put in the specifics about your compound, and then you can vary different um, measurement components of a clinical trial design, simulate what that design is going to give you at the end of the day, so that you are more likely to conduct a trial where the trial design is going to show differentiation between the treatment and control arm. So if the trial fails, you can have more certainty. It failed because your drug doesn't have an effect, not that the actual design was flawed. Because we have learned after many years that many of the patients who've been enrolled in these Alzheimer's disease treatment trials actually did not have dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, but due to other, um, other types of diseases. So this tool is not a replacement for doing a standard pivotal phase three trial but it certainly helps reduce the risk of the hundreds of millions of dollars of investments that a company is going to make in a clinical trial. FDA gave a positive decision that this tool was a, what they call fit for purpose, and it was the first time ever FDA made this type of decision, and the European Medicines Agency actually gave it a, a qualification status, and it was also the first tool that was ever qualified in Europe we did get some nice press about that as well. And I'd like to spend, uh, we've got about five minutes left, so I'll leave, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about another disease area where we've used modeling to try and increase um, the likelihood of success in using total kidney volume as a biomarker that can be used to study um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So this disease is a genetic disorder that affects approximately 12 million people around the globe. There is no cure, and 
there really is no effective treatment. There are a couple of companies that are interested in doing research in this area, but there have been huge barriers to entry. And this next slide explains what some of the, the barrier is. So the pictorials here are actual images of kidneys that grow in size over time because of the number of cysts that develop on the kidney. And this is a disease that typically by, by midlife, these patients are on dialysis or they're on a transplant list or other. And the present endpoint that regulatory authorities accept is um, glomerular filtration rate. And what you see is that by the time there's a marked decline in the GFR, the kidney is so damaged that there's not going to be a benefit. Yet that's the endpoint that regulators seek because that's what they're comfortable with. So what our goal is is to use a biomarker to move the desired endpoint earlier in the cycle. This way, a clinical trial can be conducted where you don't have to follow patients for 10 years or 20 years, and you can enroll patients that actually might benefit from the treatment. So this was the goal of the project. And total kidney volume, which is measured through imaging, there was a lot of data to support its use. And again, we aggregated data from a number of different sources, brought the biostatisticians and the data analytics folks together. They worked their magic. And we now have support for using we believe we have support. It's with the regulators now, and they're doing their final review. We believe we have adequate support to show that this biomarker, total kidney volume imaging, can be used as a biomarker to enrich clinical trials. When we enrich a clinical trial, we increase our likelihood of success, because we're actually loading the trial with patients that we are pretty certain have exactly the phase of the disease that we want to, to treat. And FDA has recognized the importance of this, and actually in the last 18 months, I believe they issued this guidance on clinical trial enrichment strategies. So it's better for the drug developers, it's better for the agency, but most important, it's better for the patients, because now you're not enrolling patients in a trial who actually don't have any chance of even benefiting from, from that treatment. So 30% worsening of EGFR is the typical regulatory endpoint. And this slide shows kind of what the situation is like without enrichment. So you've got a uniform, um, random uniform distribution of age of patients enrolled in a trial. In the second column, you also have a random uniform distribution of volume of the kidney that are enrolled in, in the trial. And then you can see that it can range from one to 10 years for how long you're gonna to have to follow patients to actually show that there's some change um, to reach the status of 30% worsening of EGFR. So with the simulation tool, uh, excuse me, it's not a simulation tool yet. It is a um, disease progression model that we are using to support the biomarker. Um, quickly, the graph on the left, the one in green, shows those who have a smaller volume and will progress more slowly. Um, you can see the difference in the slope between that chart and the one on the right, which is a pictorial of those who would have a larger kidney volume will progress more rapidly. If you enroll those in the right on your trial, you're getting the right subset of patients in the trial, and you're more likely to get to a result. FDA in particular very much likes in our qualification programs to put forth a decision tree. What type of regulatory decision will be made based on the use of that tool? So this is an example of, of what the decision tree looks like that we're proposing. And I'm not going to walk you through all of it, but if you just look at the one on the far left, the prevention of early outcome, so this would be looking at that endpoint of 30% worsening, and we can now we, we know the window of total kidney volume, and we know the age range that patients should meet as entry criteria. So um, it's our hope that over time, we can actually get this tool as a surrogate endpoint that would be accepted as the endpoint. But that is going to take um, clinical trial data from several sponsors before the FDA would be willing to, to, um, to agree to that. So I do just want to let you know about some other things that, that we have in progress. Um, we also are still working on qualification of some additional biomarkers, both in the preclinical, 
which are used for internal go-no-go -no -go decisions and in the clinical space. We have just started a new program on Parkinson's disease, and we believe that we will be creating a database and potentially a clinical trial simulation tool for Parkinson's disease. We're doing the same thing with tuberculosis as well as advancing some in vitro tools. And we are working on patient reported outcome measures for seven different disease areas. And this is an area that the FDA in particular is very interested in, in us to continue to pursue. So the message is we do believe that by sharing learnings, particularly learnings from failures, we can shorten the timeline, and that the different tools and methodologies we're working on at CPATH can be embedded at different points throughout the drug development cycle, and over time will re reduce risk, cost, and the time. And with that, I'd like to thank you and particularly acknowledge the incredible support we've had through the years from the Science Foundation Arizona and Flynn Foundation, and also our grant from the FDA. So thank you very much.